top 10 the show we have paul chastain singer songwriter of the small square velvet crush and also a touring musician alongside matthew sweet and that's just naming a few now the small square has a new album coming out called ours and others it's available now on all streaming platforms it's a beautiful record and for singer songwriter enthusiast this one goes deep and that's kind of where our conversation went. It bounced everywhere, but Paul and I really got into the inside baseball of songwriting on, the, on ours and others, as well as the self-titled Small Square album. We're going to listen to a track. This track is 23rd. It's the first single off the record. So here we go. 23rd, um, the Small Square, the album Ours and Others. 23rd. Ours and others, the album, The Small Square, the band. Check it out. Available now on all streaming platforms. Right? Beautifully layered, very like Beatles y, um, very cool stuff. And the record holds up to that track you just heard. Before we get to this interview, if you hear anything you like in it, if you can like, rate, review, subscribe to this podcast and any of the podcast platforms that helps me keep talking to cool guests like Paul and sharing their insights with you. And now, without further ado, we're going to get into this conversation. Here's me and Paul. Hey, do you know a guy, he's probably about my age, um, who's a sound professional and a drummer? His name's Ron Musara. I don't know. That name sounds really familiar. Old school, but he, he used to do uh, sound for uh, Matthew Sweet Band and for my band Velvet Crush when we were touring around. And uh, he's a good friend of mine, but I haven't, haven't seen him in a long time. But I think he's still around there. Okay. Yeah, That does he, do he have like a, a venue? Like he was like, was he, I mean, was he just a touring cat or what, like? Did he have a like a? Uh, no, he worked around town. I'm okay. sure he worked for some of the sound companies there and stuff. And uh, I don't know that he had a studio. He did recording stuff, but I don't think he had a commercial studio. But mostly was a front of house guy and a drummer, also a musician. So um, I'm trying to think because like just wondered, just wondered. It's a small world, so I thought it I'd is. Ask. It is. Uh, do you ever cross paths with uh, Marky Ray or um, uh, Chris Butler? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know them by name. Okay, okay. okay. Um, but, but yeah, you know what? I was, if we, uh, as as far as the strolling down memory lane here thing, I checked out your the latest uh, episode of your cast that's up right now, and it, I I know those two cats that you were interviewing there. Oh yeah, Tim and Susan. Yeah, oh, that's they're they're awesome. They're so they're sweet. awesome, and I have the, the the history with them is a really long time ago. I did my first ever rock tour as part of the Windbreakers and Bobby Sutliff band. Yeah. And that was like in, uh, I don't even know when, like 86 or something, but we went down to Jackson and rehearsed with those guys. And um, it was a, an interesting experience, but like my first, you know, get in the van, sleep in one hotel room, uh, played at CBGB and stuff like that kind of tour that I ever did. So I was pretty green at the time, but it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And they were, I stayed with uh, Tim and Susan most of the time and, they're awesome uh, human beings, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they were so they were so cool. Like I talked with them, and then like, like, oh, do you want a vinyl? Like, sure, of course. And they sent me. Yeah, they were like part, part of gold, just kind of people. Really. Yeah, it was so. They sent me their whole discography, and wow. like, and Tim's book he wrote. Um, awesome. Did you? Uh, so I guess kind of the build off that jumping into it. Did you like? Did you, uh, with Howard being a mutual connection, did you play with Howard? Because I saw Howard played with uh, played with Tim. I, I didn't play with Howard, but the record that we were doing, uh, you know, Bobby from the Windbreakers, Bobby Sutliff, when I was playing with them, it was a, when, um, okay, they, uh, Tim made a Windbreaker record, mm -hmm. and Bobby made his solo record. It was called Only Ghosts Remain with uh, Mitch Easter. And Howard played on that record. <laughs> played bass and i and i um i feel like i might have met howard but i i don't remember specifically meet him and he he doesn't seem to remember either um but i you know i knew i had some kind of connection with him long ago and then i actually got recommended to use him by by another mutual friend but and i was like howard god i know that guy i must know him i must know him you know because we were in this, definitely in the same circles and and then as i remembered more I, we were more connected than i thought you know through the windbreakers and and that scene down there so um but uh, you know i can't remember specifically meeting him but he was at some of those shows and i you know he's a good friend of those guys and i must have met him you know but <laughs> he's another good dude yeah no like all around it was such a good group of uh, people to meet down there you know um, yeah. 
like in the southern in that circle there's like mitch easter who we ended up doing you know i did two records with with felvet crush and um in like don dixon you know another sort of offshoot of that another great dude and um uh some of the other people down there you know that i admire like the the db's guys and uh you know chris stamey and uh, peter holes apple and those guys are all real influential in my early sort of um formative years you know that that music was like like what what is this you know like <laughs> that kind of stuff and mitch's band too you know what's active and all that kind of stuff was just like the eye opener you know kind of music to me at, at that point when i was trying to start to do my own music and it's like man this is the this is the stuff i can totally you know I can relate to this. I want to, I want to do this kind of thing. You know, that was, they were like a big part of that. Yeah. Well, so at that point, were you doing your solo, like solo stuff? <laughs> uh, when I met Tim and Susan? Yeah. Like around there. Were you... Um, That would have been, let's see. Well, the drummer from Velvet Crush that before we had Velvet Crush named Rick Menk, he and I did, projects together and so we re we recorded and released wrote songs and recorded and released things under sort of different names at the time and um i had done a solo thing i think at that point solo record but uh, so we were recording stuff with him that was called like springfields and uh and this the stuff that was more of me singing was this I, I had a thing called bag of shells and we were doing all these kind of little things and we'd like put out you know singles or cassettes or whatever we could do and i think that's what was going on at that point it was it was before uh we took the step to do velvet crush it was it was just before that stuff and we were both living in, in champaign illinois so was that kind of like we, a like a we can try whatever we want and see what sticks type of thing or was that yeah just, it was just kind of we just had met and um we had real similar interests and so we were just yeah we were just trying to we were writing songs together and just seeing what we could do and trying trying different stuff and then trying to get it recorded somehow which back then was you know a lot more difficult everyone just couldn't record stuff in their yeah. house or whatever you had to go to a studio so which means it cost money which means you had to figure out how to do that so we were basically kind of doing that and really learning about songwriting and um and interested in you know all the stuff that was coming out of like I said, that area, and then also stuff that was coming out of England at the time, like um, Sarah Records and those kinds of things, and um, you know, all that stuff was just like, wow, this all everything's so cool. There was a lot of good, uh, good stuff happening that we were, we were kind of tapping into and inspired by. So it was before all, yeah, it was really before we had a really a solid kind of group going on. Which uh, one one of those yeah. groups I wanted to ask you about was Choo Choo Train. Right. So this would have been. This would have been just uh, prior to that. Choo Choo Train was really the first thing we did that was kind of actually a group because we, well, it was still just me and Rick really, but but we actually got this guy, Darren Cooper, who has a band called Three Hour Tour, and we got him and this other guy, Rob Moore, and we actually toured in England and did like a really kind of, you know, bare bones pub tour, crappy things, sleeping on people's floors, and you know, asking literally asking from the stage if there's yeah. someplace we could stay for that night. You know, we oh, literally man. did that, <laughs> <laughs> which which sometimes was amazing and sometimes was like, oh my god, what did we get ourselves into? <laughs> you know, like uh, it ran the gamut, but you know, all character building kind of stuff like that. So that was uh that was right around that time too. Probably that was just a little bit after the we met uh tim and bobby and those guys and then rick and i um decided to uh move out of the midwest well rick uh rick mank was from uh, lived in uh, barrington illinois which is a chicago suburb and we'd been recording up in schaumburg illinois with a friend of his named michael freeman and we did some recordings together and i started doing some solo like a sort of second solo thing up there and then but then rick and i started working together and after a while, we decided to get out of the Midwest. I don't know. We just thought, you know, we need to get out of here. It's so hard to, it's so hard to play. Like, you know, like everything's really kind of far apart was our thinking, you know, yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah. We, we, so we were in central Illinois. So it's about two and a half hours of Chicago, about two and a half hours of St. Louis. And then after that, like what, you know, then what, you know, then <laughs> yeah. you're talking longer halls. You got like Iowa city or, you know, uh, Columbia, Missouri, uh, Kansas city and stuff. It's far, you know? So we were like, man, if we look on the East coast, you can really like, you know, you got like 
Boston, Providence, you know, New York, Philly, and you know, you can kind of string your way down to DC and stuff. So we that was kind of our loose, loose plan. So we really moved out to the East Coast kind of on a wing and a prayer. We had like no money. You know, I brought a guitar and some clothes and that was kind of all all we had at the time. And uh um ended up um staying with a friend that I, I didn't know, but Rick had met and who was actually from Wisconsin. His name was Jeffrey. And uh, we stayed with him and he eventually became the third member of Velvet Crush. But he was kind enough to let us crash there while we figured our stuff out and, uh, and got a place. And then uh, we started working with him after that. So that was really the beginning. That was about 89. That was the beginning of the Velvet Crush, the group sort of proper at that point. So like, I guess that's really kind of like, awesome songwriting like building up to velvet crush like they have all these like kind of duo like single projects and then like working solo stuff like i guess like can you kind of put me in the mindset of that songwriting discovery up until velvet <laughs> crush well i was really interested in learning how to write songs that was like my first thing that i was interested in like when i started hearing records you know like i hear the beatles records or stuff like that and i was really interested in melodic kind of songs and i was interested in harmonies and things like that and the, and then the way you put songs together once i started really kind of digging into it more, i was like wow how do they make these songs you know they're so perfect and yeah. like how do you do that so i was really sort of fascinated by that and um so I'm not really sure what Rick's main angle was, but he was very plugged into like records and the record scene and, you know, read it. He read tons of fanzines and he knew all about all these bands I didn't know about from, like I said, like from England and from all different parts of the U.S. And which was really harder to do, much harder to do back then with no Internet. And none of these none of these bands had like major exposure, you know, like you couldn't. It was, not many of them were on major labels, you know. And um, there were some records in England, like Sarah Records, which I mentioned, and um, Subway, which we put records out on. Actually, Choo Choo Train put some records out on that record at label. And then a Creation were really cool indie labels, and they were like they put out just cool stuff that you know that the heads of the label loved, and that was you know what they did. And then like the the sort of southern contingent of the U.S., like Mitch's arena, Mitch Easter's area, and, and Tim and Bobby and those guys, and all that, all that stuff was all great. And there was stuff out of California is great, and um, these guys in Chicago named Shoes, who are our friends now, but they're in Zion, Illinois, and they uh, they made their first record in their living room, and then went on to get signed um, to a major label deal. They were like a power pop you know, sort of prototype power pop band almost. And, uh, and we're still friends with those. In fact, John from Small Square um, plays with them. And Rick also plays drums with them. They both play drums for them from time to time. And they're good friends of ours. But um, that's kind of stuff that, so it was those two. And Rick was interested in making songs too, you know. So um, between the two of us, we had enough kind of um, energy and ideas to, to, to really try and do it, you know, dig into that kind of stuff. Um, but my focus was really a lot more on songwriting, um, personally. So that's what I was really interested in. And, and I was interested in collaborating and doing it myself in all different ways you could, you could do it. So I, I was trying to develop that, I guess. I, I didn't think of it that way, you know, but yeah. I just wanted to do it, you know? And so, you know, I got, when they came out, I got a four track cassette recorder where I could overdub stuff. And that was like, you know, insanely great thing to have. Like what I can, I can over, uh, uh, what, you know? Because I remember um, I bought at a garage sale a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. And some of the reel-to-reel -reel tape machines back in the day used to have uh, the capability of recording on, like you could flip the reel over and record, or you could record uh, without flipping the reel, you could record on, on both sides of the tape, like it would split it and yeah. record, like so you could have sort of two programs on one tape. And so I remember trying to record a song on it and and putting materials over the uh the record head i mean over the erase head on the machine uh, so i could overdub i was yeah. trying to you know i'm I was trying to figure out how i could do it you know <laughs> and then uh and then somebody i can't remember who put out fostex or somebody released a, a cassette four track recorder and i was just like oh my god <laughs> you know it's my dream you know so i could then i could sort of um do different parts to songs or do different vocal things you know harmonies and stuff and uh and that was a huge step for me because it was 
I was into that part of it too, the recording process of it. So I, that was, you know, kind of got me started on that. But um, it was so great to then I could experiment with harmonies and different things like that. And um, it was a real eye opener and a, a sort of watershed moment with all that. But then, um, you know, we Rick and I just kept writing together and working together and decided we wanted to really try and do something, you know, with a band, like get a band, get a live band and, you know, and continue up the path we are on, but um, uh, make it sort of more solid, you know, more, more, more real, more realized. So that's, that's when we decided to get, get out of town here, you know, get out of uh, the, the middle West. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's ge- like geographically, it's kind of like, like I, cause I think about where, where I'm at in Cleveland. I'm like, I can, I can get to Chicago. If I go that way, I can get to yeah. New York. If I go farther enough. Well, Ohio is huge. <laughs> so like, even if you're playing in state, it's like still like a bunch of halls to get. Oh yeah. To get to like from one to the other with no money. I mean, we're talking about having no money. Yeah. Dude, yeah. It's yeah. not like you have a tour budget or something and you know, and you're in a <laughs> car, not even a van or, you know, or two cars and stuff like that. And Caravan, so, yeah. yeah, the Midwest <laughs> is pretty brutal. The Midwest is pretty brutal for that. They're just so far. It's like, well, Iowa city, like, Oh my God, that's really far. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, let's go to Lincoln, Nebraska. You know, like it's, it's really far. It's doable, but like, wow, you know. So we just thought we need to get to a place where we can play um, more often. You know, like like logistically more often, and and um, you know, keep doing it because that was kind of a it was a loose plan, but I think it was a pretty pretty sound plan actually. You know, because we wanted to be able to do more shows in more cities um, easily. So. Oh, definitely. That's what we did. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, booking out of town, at least on my end, it, as of now, has been the hardest thing. And I, it, it was a little easier before 2020, but after, it's like any connection you had was gone, and you're like, uh, yeah, a lot of them, are, a lot of them are gone. I've had yeah. the, the trouble with uh, in foreign countries. I was trying to book, you know, find somebody to book some stuff, and and a lot of those smaller uh, ones just, you know, they 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 couldn't make it, and. Uh, I, actually, I just got back Wednesday from Spain with all the crush to like a little yeah. sort of reunion How'd thing that in Spain. Go? That's sick. It went it went great, and we haven't been there. Well, I've been there with Matthew Sweet. Maybe we were there in 2018, but um, as Velvet Crush, we weren't there since then, like the 90s, like the mid mid 90s. And um, the the guy that um, we knew over there that books people, the company's called Heart of Gold, actually survived. You know, they they've been around since the 90s, and they survived the pandemic somehow. You know, they shut down, but they they came back, and then uh, he he hit it full on when when he was able to, and uh, and he invited us over, kind of uh, kind of connected to the reissue of the um, Teenage Symphonies record yeah, that yeah. was like the anniversary, 30th anniversary, and so um, he was able to do that and bring us over, and and you know, but but he his company could have easily been gone. You know, that's the kind of places that were gone. Except he had he'd been pretty established. They're by, by, by no means large. They're a small company, but he, somehow they were able to negotiate it. I'm not sure how he did it, but uh, um, we were glad that he did. And he's still bringing lots of people over. And um, but he again, he he brings people over that he likes, you know. So we're we're in his wheelhouse, but other bands might not necessarily be. But um, that that was a great opportunity, and, and we uh, we love playing in Spain. The, the fans are really really. Um, die hard and um like it's just so genuine you know like so so loving it and wearing it on their sleeve you know it's like the best place that you know as a musician you want to play places like that right so of course yeah that's that's the that's the ideal crowd <laughs> like <laughs> so it was really uh great to, to go back over and, and see david and, and and then reconnect with the spanish fans a lot of whom you know are older and still came out to some of these uh some of these events that we did and it was very uh heartwarming and and fun and uh we we could almost really do it by the sort of end of the tour <laughs> just getting back to the swing of it but uh yeah it was good it was good that's awesome like musically i had a friend who who went to spain in um in in the searching to study flamenco and, and oh, wow. music like that and like lived with a guy or like for a week or something like that and like just had like a completely interesting perspective of their trip to spain um did you catch any of that or was it just like show 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 um, 
you know what I mean? Well, we didn't have a ton of time. We, we did rehearse over there since we all live in different places now. We actually just set up to, to do rehearsals there. So we rehearsed in Madrid for three days. Yeah. Because we, we hadn't played together since um, 2019. And before that, hadn't played together in about 25 years. So, yeah. I mean, Rick and I play in Matthew Sweet's band. So we, we played together more, more frequently. But um, we haven't played as that band um, in a long time. So we spent a little time there and it was kind of familiar, you know, it was coming back just a bit since we'd been there, but the, Spain has kind of a cool, um, old worldness to it where, I mean, it, you know, Madrid's like a modern city and everything. And it's quite, quite large. I'm not sure how big it is. It seems maybe sort of like Chicago or something in size maybe, but, um, but there's something about Spain that's real kind of mysterious and, um, and old, old worldish in a, in a charming way in a nice way you know like you know just like like if you go and you know have lunch and you're going to go have like a tapas or sandwich or something and it's just like how how it's always been kind of you know and uh you know you get your jamon and your cheese sandwiches or, or plate of, you know tapas and a, and a glass of uh regional wine and like you're just set you know like it's like that it's so uh it's so cool like that and there's a lot more modern stuff going on too but there are parts of spain that are that are really just that way like the last place that we played which was a little festival yeah. down in the southern part of spain and and it was um it was just the whole little small city was very just old old school and uh it was very cool you know nothing like i mean more like europe if you're from europe you you, you wouldn't be maybe so different but f- being from the united states um it's older than anything like you know the east coast has its age and stuff but but this is much older than that you know much it seems older and it seems more exotic because it's more european and even uh, there's, you know, Moorish influence there, too. So it's got very sort of exotic uh, feel to it. and But really charming. And you, you could see how you could just kind of just go there and yeah. you know, stay. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like it yeah. has like, it seems like it'd be negotiable to do it. And it's really away from the some of the, the modern world just a little bit, just enough, you know. But yeah, really, it's very cool. Yeah, it would be great to go spend some time over there just like like your friend was doing that would be pretty awesome because then you really soak in you know the culture and see what people do day to day which i think is the most interesting thing about going to visiting countries if you can be there long enough to really see how the people are living what they do you know and how they are that's cool and i got it like i don't know i like i like traveling with like kind of having set and up something set up like oh i'm gonna go play there and then i can i can look around you know what i mean like i i i like having that goal <laughs> post you know uh, yeah. In my head, I justify I, it makes sense why I'm here now. But um, as I kind of jump into those like rehearsals in this completely different place, did that kind of help hone in? Like, uh, I mean, I'm sure the pressure from the gigs and the lack of seeing each other did. But like being in a distant location, that kind of helped focus that. Um, probably because we were we were really just there for that purpose, and you know, like when we started the band, um, that's really all we were doing. I mean, we had to work day jobs and stuff, but eventually we got to quit those. And but but since that time, you know, other things happen in your life and um, you can't just like devote fully your time and attention to the project. You know, like I can't I can't do that now. And and so what that but we were able to do that then because we were just there, you know, with you know what I mean? There were there were very few other um responsibilities at that very moment that we had so yeah it was cool but once we got in the space you know it's like any other space it didn't matter what country we're in but but it was um it was uh yeah it was it was great to be able to kind of really focus on it because if you're at home uh, for me anyway it's just hard to really um have any sort of extended period of time where you can just shirk all of your responsibilities (laughs) you know and uh sort of uh fuck off to the <laughs> rehearsal space or whatever you know yeah. like unless you're like a full-on you know like that's what you do 100 percent of the time you're touring and doing all stuff and but, but for, for like this kind of thing like a reunion thing um not not so much the case so that was that was cool and we also had with us um this guy dave gibbs who uh is, was in a band called gigolo ants and they're from boston and he played with us quite a lot did touring with us back in the 90s but we had not played with him or seen him even you know, in like 
in like 28 years or something. So, so we, we, we had asked him to come along with us and he, he graciously, um, accepted and it, but, but, but I guess it playing with him, even though it's been all those years, it was sort of like, it just all fit back together in a really kind of fun way and made it, made it easier, I think for everybody, um, to have the four of us playing together because it sort of stays with you a little bit you know like the, yeah. the chemistry how we play together and stuff even though we're different players now but it was still kind of there and uh that and and he also has connections with the the and fans in spain that his band was actually quite known in spain more so maybe than velvet crush so um he has a good relationship with spain and was really ready to go and and uh uh you know, and reconnect with that too, because he hadn't been in quite some time. So all that was really good. And um, it turned out to be a really positive thing. And we hopefully can go back in a couple of years or something. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. it sounds amazing. It sounds like a yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, great opportunity. One thing I want to unpin, like, so you get this four track and you're like, now the world of like harmonies, because I had a friend who had a reel to reel to actually same friend who went to Spain and like trying to figure that out or watch them figure that out. I was kind of like, eh, it sounds like a headache, but um, like it, this new record, the harmonies that the production on it is so like beautiful. Um, can you oh, tell thanks. me like in, for harm for myself, like, you know, I practice harmonies and it took me a real long time to get okay at them, you know? Um, like, did that come easy to you and did that like expand the songwriting palette? Like, so, like, um, well, that, you know what? I gotta say that when I was saying my, my first focuses were on, on songwriting, but I was also really fascinated by, by harmony singing. I don't know why it just like sounded cool to me before I knew anything about it, you know? So I'd like hear like, you know, the Beatles and they have a lot of harmonies, right? And their kind of influences were you know, like the Everly Brothers. So I checked that out. It's like, oh my God, this is like, you know, insane. Like, you know, like the, the Everly Brothers, the, the greatest, you know, harmony singing brothers, you know. Um, I don't know if you've heard, heard much of that stuff, but they're like, oh, yeah. it's just like thick, you know. And then and then I got into like Simon and Garfunkel because I, I like folk kind of stuff too, you know, acoustic guitar kind of stuff. And they were like insanely great you know, singers and, you know, harmony singers. And it just was fascinating to me. And I remember having a, one of their early records, I think it's called the one called Wednesday morning, 3 a.m. And the, the version I had yeah. of it um, on a cassette or something, um, you could each of their voices would be on the, the pan, the hard pan to one side or the other. Right. So Paul would be on one side and Art Garfunkel on the other side. So I remember driving in my car and panning you know, to one side so I could sing the other part, you know, like uh, I'm going to pan over and I can't hear you know, Paul Simon's part now, so I'll sing that. And then I would do the other, like, now I can't hear our, our Garfunkel's voice. So I'd see, because I was just like really, um, I was really interested in it for some reason. It sounded so cool to me. And I was always interested in how they voiced their things to, you know, like what, what, what were the coolest things they did and all that stuff. So I just kind of like, I didn't mean to be doing it at the time, but I sort of studied it, I guess. Yeah. You could say. And um, so nowadays, you know, many, many years later, um, it's just kind of part of the of my makeup you know what i what i do so i'll hear a thing and i'll go oh and i don't like to have harmonies on everything but i when they happen i i you know really enjoy them so um it's just kind of how i it's so natural to think of it i i, I think the way i you know i can hear it in my head like oh that could be that and also i gotta say you know i've been playing with matthew sweet for a long time as his uh a, a member of the live band and i and i sing with him you know, which is a great treat, you know, and so yeah. I sing harmonies with Matthew, like, you know, for, for years and years, I've done that. So, uh, another, he's another kindred spirit. His songs are, you know, not far afield from the kind of songs I make and, and we understand each other and I, and his harmonies are great and I love kind of doing them with him. So that's also kind of helpful, you know, like just to for hear sure. a, a friend and another artist and a peer how they um, arrange their stuff and it's all, you know, it all soaks in and you, um, you take away from, from a lot of that, you know, one of the, I got it. This reminds me, sorry, I'm getting a little bit off track here, but no, I love it, uh, at one point, speaking of singing um, at one point uh, after Teenage Symphonies was out, Velvet Crush got to do a, a, a gig with Roger McGuinn of the birds and, and we yeah, got to be yeah. his band 
for yeah. a, a, short, a short set of music in New York at the small club. And um, so I got to sing harmony with Roger McGuinn. So it was like, oh, my God, <laughs> which to me, because I was a huge Birds fan. Right. So that was like one of the, you know, crowning achievements. It was like, oh, my God, it was so cool. I got to sing. I was singing like eight miles high with Roger McGuinn. Like that's, you know, like, you know. Yeah. 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 So I'll never, never really forget that. And maybe I didn't sing that. Well, I don't know. But it was just like, oh, shit, man, I'm doing this. <laughs> you know, it was very cool. That Well, th- there's that's. I think going back to that Simon and Garfunkel practice like that, I think the the one thing I've learned like learned from grinding my head against the wall to try to get harmonies right is there's that feeling of like that interval when you hit it. You're like, oh, this is it. You know what I mean? And, and then it sounds right, feels right. Yeah. And like yep. but to you can get, feel it, like you kind of vibrate. Yeah. Yeah. But to get there is so so challenging at first. Um so well, you know, it also depends, I think, on who whom you're singing with. Like if you're singing true. with yourself, it's maybe easier because you kind of naturally do the same thing. But if you're if you're a background singer singing with other people, oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. kind of have to get on their wavelength and you know, like their you know pitch and and their um, kind of inflections and stuff, and try and to get that what you're talking about that sort of vibration thing to kind of happen. You gotta you gotta become. It, you got to go into their world a little, become them a little bit, I think, you know, to understand. That's what I think really great singers can kind of do naturally, you know, background singers. Um, so you have to be aware of, it's not just about whether you're singing in tune or not. In fact, a lot of times it's not about that at all. You know, like you can, you can auto-tune everybody or melodyne or whatever, but um, people, humans don't sing, you know, completely 100% on you know mathematically on on a pitch it just doesn't happen some some guys are really great and sound like they kind of are but even they even those people those men or women aren't doing it so you just have to um listen you really have to kind of listen and feel like you're saying that's i think that's the key to it you feel what you're um you feel when it's in tune you hear it and feel it you know and then when it's right it's great and you know it you know it's like uh, undeniable (laughs) right because it sounds really awesome yeah yeah how that's and it's just, people say the, 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 how people sing words too so i totally get that like inflection yep. like yep. well you said r but they say r you know <laughs> like or right whatever. and it's not going to sound completely like in sync kind of if you don't kind of do what they are doing you know? right right then it's two separate but tracks. if you sing with somebody for a number of years like i have done with matthew i i kind of know how he's i can feel how he's going to do it or i know how he does it kind of so you have a little bit of a head start but some people like get, that can just meet an artist for the first time and start singing with them, you know, that is tricky and, and that you have to be really sort of uh, uh, trained and in tune with it to, to be able to jump onto a, you know, like, Oh, I'm going to go sing with this famous artist now. And yeah. harmony. It's like, you got, you got to be, you know, you, there's, there's an art to that for sure. There's like a, a science and an art to that. How, like, how'd you meet Matthew? Um, I meet Matthew sweet. Um, let's see. Uh, well, um, let's see. It was, it was through Rick Menk. And so about the same time when I re- met Rick, he also met Matthew around the same year even. Um, and he had, I think the way he met him was he, Matthew did this record as a duo with another friend of his called The Buzz of Delight. And they put out a vinyl EP, I believe. And Rick um got it heard it and got it i don't know how he knew who he was but he just saw it and looked cool and he bought it and um and loved it and then he wrote matthew a letter and matthew is from uh, lincoln nebraska and that's where he was living at the time so he wrote to him and they just started kind of being pen pals because they had just like rick and i do and and matthew and i do we all kind of are coming from the same place with stuff that we kind of love you know like music and so they bonded on that. And um, eventually, uh, a few years later, Matthew, uh, let's see, Matthew got, he had moved to New York and he had gotten uh, signed to, well, they used to do these things called uh, development deals where a major record company would kind of invest in you for the future and say, okay, what do we want you to do is, to work on some songs and stuff and, and your thing, work on your thing. And we're going to, you know, give you an advance and pay, pay for you to do this kind of, you know, um, 
for a certain amount of time with an eye on at some point in the near future, you're going to, you're going to start making a record, but we want you to kind of develop first, you know, kind of get your, your thing is going in a good direction. We want to help you if we can. And so it was like a very cool thing, you know? So he had that going on <clears throat> and through that he did make a record and he put out a record and needed a band to go play some shows. And so he called Rick and said, uh, I, they want me to do shows and I got a, you know, I got, I need a band and I don't, I don't know if I have no, the people that I could do that with. And he said, well, you know, I'll do it. And then I could get, I could get Paul to play bass who, who I haven't met him yet. I didn't know him yet, but he said, he goes, okay, okay. Well, that's a good start. So, so we did that. And we added a couple other guys that, uh, one of which was uh, a friend of Rick's. I think that he had known this guy, Eric Peterson on guitar. <clears throat> anyway, so that we went to actually up to Zion, Illinois, to the recording studio that was run and owned by shoes, the band that I referenced yeah, yeah, earlier. Yeah. And we rehearsed there. <clears throat> we rented out the space and, and uh, rehearsed. And that's, I think that's when I met Matthew for the first time is when we were preparing for this whole tour that we did. And, um, <clears throat> so we, we practiced and, um, we did ended up touring and we, I think what we did on that tour was we opened for, uh, Robin Hitchcock and the Egyptians, um, on a bunch of shows. And then we did some other opening things as well. Um, but this is pre-girlfriend. Now this is for, uh, Matthew's record, which was called earth. Okay. <clears throat> And so that was when I met Matthew. And then, but ever since then, I've been, we, you know, we became friends and I've been playing with him off and on. And he's worked on, you know, our record, Velvet Crush records and such um, over the years from that point forward. So that was, that was in the late 80s also, probably 80, probably just before Velvet Crush. So that was probably around 88 or something like that. <clears throat> I've been a fan of his work for a while. Like, how did like, as far as like hanging out with uh, with Matthew, like, and, and songwriting, did you see any of those inflections, and working and singing with, and like? Kind of well, you know, Ma Matthew's a great. Uh, he's kind of a genius songwriter. He he he's the kind of guy, which is the opposite of how I am. He's the kind of guy that can, um, you know, he can just sit down and write songs. You know, like, so when he makes a record, he'll often write like 30 songs, you know, and then pick some for the record. Like he'll just do, he can just do it. And it's like insane. You know, I, I don't know. I can't do that, but he's like just gifted and can, and some of them maybe are cooler than others, but they're all, you know, pretty damn good. You know, like <laughs> he can just, he just has this thing or he can do it. And, um, you know, I admire him, his abilities and, He's this very talented guy. Um, so, but yeah, I saw how he worked and we, we worked with him. He recorded our band and did stuff with us and uh, over the years, but he, you know, he's pretty self-contained, but, but Rick, Rick Menk plays on most of his records, maybe all of them. Um, I don't play on too many of them. I play on a couple maybe, but um, cause he, he's a bass player and he's a guitar player. So, and he usually does most of his own vocal stuff too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, just from being associated with him and knowing him and being friends with him, uh, I'm sure a lot of that. I'm sure there's been some uh, some influence from him, you know, to me. Right. How could there not be, you know? And and I do love his songs, you know, and it's a uh, great a great pleasure to go and play them in front of people with him, you know, like to just be able to play those songs, you know. You, you, I, I mean, we played some of them so many times, but I I I gotta say I don't really dislike playing any of them. You know, I just like if they were my songs, I would dislike playing some of them, right? But, but like the stuff from uh, from Girlfriend, which was the first, you know, real real thing where you, where people want want to hear songs from. We played those songs just like hundreds of times, you know, and um, but they still are fun to play, and they're fun to the people really uh, like them, you know. So that makes it fun too to see when you play like I've been waiting or something, and people. People have gotten, you know, tell me all, uh, all the time, like, oh, yeah, that we we got we played that song at our wedding and we did this. And like we played that when our, our daughter was born or what, you know, all these yeah. things like life connected yeah. to their lives yeah. in like these crazy ways. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, that's really important to some of these people. And you can tell when when you play the songs, people really uh, acknowledge. And um, it's it's just so um, it's really cool to be able to partake in that, you know, to be part of that happening. That's incredible. And like to 
so kind of what was going to say. Um, I wanted to piggyback or jump off that into I guess so your songwriting style. But so he does he will write is it like lyrics and music just boom done? Yeah, well, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I feel like he. <clears throat> Actually, I'm not sure what his method is. I think it may may vary from time to time. But uh, so the last time I was I was there when he was recording something was probably when he was doing um um the record maybe like in 2017 or 18 and and he had songs uh he had songs he had like they weren't even full songs when I when I went there to his house he had like um the kind of a skeletal chordal ideas of the song. And I think a lot of it was in his head, but he had written down a little bit and he, he didn't have lyrics connected to them maybe in his head again, but nothing I could see. So the songs were like given an, a number, a, a letter. So it was like song A, song B, song C, song D, you know, song Q, song whatever. And he had a whole bunch of them. And so he picked, he would pick one and Rick and I were there and he would pick a song I think this was the Tomorrow Forever record, maybe. <clears throat> and he, so he would pick a song and say, well, let's try this one. And um, uh, his basic goal of doing that was would be to kind of get a drum track with Rick. And maybe he would keep his scratch guitar, but maybe he wouldn't. You know, it depends on what happened. But I was kind of helping to, like, engineer. So I would record for them. And he, if he was doing acoustic, he would have to go in a different room where Rick was playing the drums. And so um, I just, you know, pressed press stop and start and stuff and and they try to get through the song <clears throat> but there weren't any uh i don't know if he gave any i can't remember if he had melodic ideas uh recorded or not i think it was just sort of like the feel of it he was going for with rick but then he had some inkling of lyric ideas i think because then once he got it he's like okay and he would be able to write the lyrics pretty quickly you know for each one but but so, but I don't know if that's his normal method. I think sometimes he gets a, a you know a, a, a phrase idea and works. You can work from that too. He can work all different ways, but he can work so fast. You know, he's just so sharp at doing it, and so uh, he can get something pretty pleasing in a very short amount of time, and it's pretty incredible to me <laughs> anyway. Because I I you know labor over this stuff a lot more, and he <clears throat> he gets them out. Like for that record, he had about forty songs, I think. Um, that he recorded and he recorded all of them and then picked kind of sent him out to people to you know like his manager and different people to get their opinion on their take on what songs were this you know the strongest or whatever they had feelings about like that but um he really gets them out like he has ideas he gets them down he's you know out of his head and um into the world and then figures out what they are at that point which i think is the smart way to do it <clears throat> but yeah he's uh <clears throat> He sucks for doing that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I'm so jealous that he can he can just do stuff so fast, and I'm like so slow at doing it. But uh, but you know, everybody has their own methods and stuff, and he, sure. he's he's maybe more of a genius, I guess. You know what, what can I say? <laughs> Was it so? I I read with your kind of approach, just kind of taking that that kind of phrase and trying to find that um, I guess that song seed. So can you kind of explain your your method in that sense? <laughs> Um, what I usually do is that at times when I'm not trying to write a song, <clears throat> I'll have some kind of an idea a lot of times, like I'll hear some kind of melody or I'll think of a phrase. Usually it's a more musical thing than lyric. Yeah. Lyrics are usually the hardest and last thing to finish. But, um, so I'll, I maybe hear something in my head and it, if I don't forget it by the time I get to a place where I can do something about it, then I'll go, okay, well, um, I shouldn't neglect it. So I'll take out my phone and you know, make a little voice memo recording of a pick up the guitar, you know, and, and figure out that, you know, figure out kind of what I was hearing. And a lot of times it's just a couple, you know, like four measures or eight measures or something. Sometimes it's a bit more, <clears throat> but I'll just kind of do that usually. And then, um, and then usually walk away from it and, and come back a little later in the day or the next day or something and then go, okay, what was that thing that I thought of and see how it, see what it says to me, you know, and then, if it clicks, uh, then I'll, I'll, you know, play it. I'll sit there and play it, you know, play my guitar with it and stuff and see if we'll see if anything sort of comes to mind or if anything gets married to it, like words or any, you know, phrase or something. Or sometimes I'll have the phrase idea later and I'll go, oh, that might work with that thing I just made up. So, but at any given time, I might have several of those little pieces, you know, floating around. 
uh, that need to be that, that that could be worked on. You know, so some of them get lost and forgotten, and some of them might develop into more things. But it but it's a bit more of a often it takes more time. You know, like uh, I can get the musical part together fairly quickly if it's something that seems cool to work on. You know, I feel like I have a feeling for it. But then putting lyrics and stuff to it, a lot of times that is the part that I draw out for a long time. <laughs> so when I go to record with John, well, so first of all, I live in Japan. Yeah. And John lives in Wisconsin, right? So we don't we don't just go and jam together all the time. So what happens is I'll, I'll come over and go to his studio. He has a studio. He has a commercial studio that he owns and manages. And so we go there and, and I'll bring whatever i kind of have at the time usually once a year sometimes twice a year right so um, i'll bring whatever i have sometimes they're a full demo like i've got a complete kind of song where i did guitar and bass and i did singing and a drum machine or whatever and sometimes it's just like a, a, a music track with no words on it and sometimes it's just a piece of a song you know that i think we could maybe develop into something and all those kind of different things i bring and then you know then i get there and see what sometimes he has you know, a piece of something or, a, or an idea or a something, you know, that we can also develop. So it kind of depends. We've done it all different ways. Like on the on the new record, um, <clears throat> well, the first song, the first song started as John's piano idea. Like he had this thing, said, oh, I have these chords. And I, I said, oh, play it for me. So he played it. And I was like, oh, I like that's cool. But it was only kind of the, it was kind of basically one or two parts, you know, and it wasn't quite a whole song. So, but I felt sort of inspired by it. And I was like, oh, well, we should do this. We should like make it a song, you know? So I sat down at the piano and worked on it for a little while, um, kind of on the spot and tried to figure out a, like a bridge thing. Cause I thought it needed like a bridge part to go to, you know, a separate, a third part that wasn't there yet. And so I got something that I kind of liked and we decided to record it. So, um, you know, I, I asked, I said he should play the piano part of his part because I didn't know it, you know, and I thought it sounds cool the way you do it, so you should do it. And he goes, okay, but I can't play the part that you made up because I don't know how to play those chords. I said, well, but, okay, so you play, and then when you're done with your part, I'll play my part. So, <laughs> and so we did, and we just, like, <clears throat> we didn't have anybody recording for us. Sometimes we have an engineer a lot of times so helping us out, but I think that day it was just us. So we would uh, start the start the recording and then um, he played his part. And the way the song's structured, there's like these pauses. So we worked out the form of it and then he played his verses and chorus parts. And then when it came to the bridge, he he held a note down on the piano that was sustaining and he physically got up off the bench and I sat down on the piano bench. And then I started playing the bridge of the song. And, you know, when I got done, I held the notes out and he sat down so we did it like in real I and mean, we could have done it separately and you know easily done that but we just <laughs> did it that way which is kind of funny and it was fun and funny to do but yeah, that's it, the way we that's the way we got the piano track to the song because it was, it was our real uh, grand piano that was in a studio that turned so out that's amazing the basis of the song and then <laughs> from there i had to take it and um i i wrote the melody and the words kind of later after that point but we had the, the that was the basic track of the song was the piano. And that was the song form that we used and, uh, and added, um, added the drums and stuff at different, at different times. I don't, or maybe we might've added drums then at that time. I, I'm not sure. I can't remember when we did it. it. It took a little time to develop all the way because I didn't have the, it took me some time to get the melody and the words kind of worked out. Um, but that, it was a cool start to the song, and that was that was one of the times when it was based on an idea that he just had had, yeah. but hadn't recorded or played at all, and I had never heard it before. So he got there. When I got there, he played it. But there are other songs, you know, where I had a whole track worked out, and he kind of added drums basically to a demo, maybe version that I had, and then we kind of replaced stuff because nowadays, you know, with using Pro Tools and stuff like that, DAWs, you can kind of just take a demo into the real recording instead of having it be two separate things. And that, yeah. I think that happens a lot more now. Well, yeah, it's like so, I, so something that started out as my demo becomes the real thing. We just replace things that we need to replace, put the real drums on. And John's really good at playing to an existing uh, track. Like if I have some you know, like my demo guitars and maybe they sound kind of cool or you want to keep them for the time being, he, he can fit his, he can play with it, 
he has some kind of magic ability to be able to sync up with, you know, with what I have done. And um, so that, you know, speeds the process up a little bit too, because then I can go, oh, well, maybe I like these guitars or maybe I don't, but we'll get a cool drum track. So we do it, we do it that way also. And sometimes we track something together, like I'll be playing guitar and he's on drums or I'll play bass or he's playing drums or we do it that way too. And so all kind of all the different ways, <laughs> whatever we can do, you know, a lot of the, a lot of, most of the time, even the songs aren't, aren't finished we don't have time, you know, with my trip over, I spent a few days there and then we don't have time to really complete a song unless it's something that had been worked on previously. But if we're starting a song, when I leave there, uh, I, I, I have to still work on it. Like I have to usually write finished lyrics or track vocals or I, I track vocals there sometimes. But So it depends on what stage it's at. But, a lot, but most of the time, the songs aren't really, the recordings aren't really completed. Sometimes the songs aren't even completed. Um, at the time we've recorded. So I leave his studio with songs in various um, phases, you know, of completion. And then I, I work on them at home and then maybe sometimes I have to ask him to add some other thing to it or, you know, do something else or, you know, whatever. And, and then on this record, um, I mixed, I think all of it at my, in my house, you know, in my, in my little room. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we did some mixes for some of the things at his place, but maybe I, I did them later again because we added something or something happened. I don't know. It's been kind of a long. It was a long process of, and uh, the record's been actually done for a, a couple of years because um, we we sort of finished it before COVID happened, and then we were trying to get somebody to put it out, and then that happened, all that stuff, and so it kind of really. Uh, it didn't help at all. <laughs> you know, it, it, we weren't really getting too much interest anyway. But but that certainly didn't uh, didn't speed things along at all. It's an amazing record, man. Like I, I went back and listened to the the first the the self titled, um, and like what blew my mind is like how like texturally different these two records are. Like in that yeah. in the first record, I noticed singing wise, you paid a lot of attention to like head voice and like those beautiful like melodies like that. And then that was kind of switched on this, but there was so much around it. And like, there was like mm -hmm. two tonally, like almost different groups. Like, can, uh, was yeah, you know, the first, the first record, um, uh, wasn't, uh, it wasn't made. The songs weren't made to be a record at least in the beginning stages of it, it, what it was, was John and I started doing stuff together, you know, kind of a long time ago. We just like, well, let's make some songs, you know, whatever. And then we got time after we had worked together for a little bit of time. He said, well, maybe we can get enough songs to do a record. And so I, I, I pulled from some demos that I had that were like pretty old, like the song uh, SML, you know, Save My Life song. That was a really old uh, demo that I had. And I brought it and I said, I really, there's something about this song I like, and I like the kind of vibe of it. But I had played, you know, sort of terrible drums on it that were, that didn't work at all. You know, we're just, they weren't, they were just meant to sort of keep time or whatever, but they sounded bad and stuff. But some of the other stuff, um, I thought the guitar sounded cool and I kind of like the bass thing I did on it. And so I brought it in and I said, could you put some kind of more substantial drums on this, you know, without you think that would blow the vibe of the song or could it, would it, you know, is there a way to get both things going on? And, and he did, he, he said, well, I'm going to play a full kit, but I'm going to use mallets. And, um, I think, I think it'll be cool. And he, and he did it and it was cool. And, and I really liked that song, but that was really a demo, you know, um, that we had sort of spruced up with putting drums and maybe only drums on that one. So some of the songs were like that. And some of the songs were from an early session that we did with our friend Brad Rice, who's a guitar player, and, and at John's farm when it, before it was a studio. It was in a farm building. We were just in this building. And then some of the songs were written later on. Um, it was over a few year period that put, we put that together. And then finally, it was like, well, we almost have enough songs, or we do have enough songs. Why don't we, you know, call this a record and see if we can get somebody to put it out? So, you know what I mean? It wasn't like a it wasn't really a focused uh, effort. It was sort of like a patchwork, you know, putting, putting, we, th these are the songs we have. So, <laughs> and then um, mixed them. And 
I, I had my friend, uh, our friend Adam Schmidt, my master, and I said, is there a way you can sort of pull this together, you know, and mastering, like kind of help it feel like it belongs together a little more? And, and I think he kind of did that, but um, it wasn't meant to all go together. So I'm sure it sort of feels good. But so on the newer record, though, we we knew we were making a new, you know, we, we always know, like, we're starting a new material. We want to release it, right? So, um, and we had completely different sort of operational uh abilities at at that point because his studio was was fully full-fledged you know and and i knew more how to do stuff what what i wanted to do also on my own so um it made it more sound like we made a record you know i think it it was more intentional sounding and, and it was more intentional so well, that, it definitely is a two. That makes sense, kind of hearing the kind of inside baseball for each record because they're both good. They're both like great records, you know. They both sound really good, and the songs are really good. Um, and on this newer one, I definitely hear that concisiveness, like the textures and everything have much more focus brought to them. And like, yeah, there's more, um, you know, a bit, a bit higher higher fidelity you know we could do than, than, than we could do on the other thing and and then uh, just kind of a little more knowledge and and nicer stuff and uh and then i don't know I, I, I i'm i don't ever like the feeling of doing the same thing over again you know so i i always kind of want to i'm not sure where john stands on that but but i i like variation you know and i like to not make the same record over and over and and i always fear that my songs are similar enough to one another that maybe uh you know if i'm doing the same sounds and the same approach every time then i'm just you know it's just like a retread you know and i i I don't want to do that so i try and mix it up a little if i can but i just think that the uh the elevation of the um you know, the studio quality and stuff we'll be able to do on this record, set it apart from the sound of the other record right off the bat. And, uh, you know, what, like, like once you record sort of more hi-fi drums, then the track sounds more hi-fi, you know, um, and then go from there. And so we upped, we upped our game on all that, on that end, you know, a lot. And then we also had some other players play, uh, other players played on the other record, but not, not quite in the same way we had we employed some other stuff on this record which gave it another kind of a flavor i think having uh like our friend shoes sang and played on uh the one called open up closer that song um and different we had a few different people play this guy john mormon a uh, guitar player who was playing with matthew sweet for a time played on the first song on 23rd and did a cool lead on that so we had a few little little things like that that we brought in to help us uh, realize you know the song Uh, we did more of that on this record and i think so i think all that stuff gives it a bit of a different flavor and vibe well it's interesting because like anytime you like bring more people in you know what i mean like you get like a different uh, i don't want to say a different just experience all overall yeah totally it's that grandeur, that friendship. I don't know. There's somehow it's somehow captured within that. You know what I mean? Like it's like I could I could yeah. record yeah, the banjo I track, yeah. but I got a guy that's really good at banjo, and look how cool it is now. You know? Well, see, I I love to do stuff myself, so same. I'm like, always hard pressed to do that. But I don't want to always sound the same, and I do know my limits. I know that I can't do some kind of screaming like lead guitar or a thing. You know, I know what I can't do, and um. And John likes to actually work with other people more, more so. He's he's he, he, that's more in his wheelhouse, I think. I, you know, I come from a band background, so I'm always about like the band does everything. You know, like yeah. the Beatles, yeah, like yeah. people didn't play on Beatles records, and outside people didn't play on them until like much later in their, you know, in their um, on their records was very much later when they had you know like the French horn guy play or something. So I, I'm more kind of from that school, but I'm certainly not opposed to uh, having other people and so on this record we kind of ran the gamut of that um like on the song called um found object for yeah, instance that was recorded with a large larger ensemble of players um live like at the same time um uh, where i was playing I, I played acoustic guitar which i think i took off the track actually at some point because I, I i wanted to have a different feel but so i was playing acoustic and john's playing drums and we had um uh a, another this guy uh 
Adam was playing uh, bass and uh, Corey was playing guitar and this guy Kevin was playing. He was uh, playing keyboards. And these were people that John had worked with in the studio, had been working with in the studio because he does projects for people like singers. You know, they don't have a band and he gets them a band, you know, that are of of, uh, great players. He has them come into a studio. So these are guys that he worked with on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And so he said, would you guys, you know, try to track a couple songs with us, you know, for our thing. And they said, yeah, as a favor, kind of, I don't, you know, we didn't pay him or anything. So um, it was very nice of them. But anyway, so so that song we tried to do as a big band thing, kind of what I call like a Nashville style, you know, old school Nashville session where you have everybody playing live. And we did that song and we did another song too, but uh, that one's the one that I thought worked. And we got some pretty cool, pretty cool, like a, instant you know track out of it it wasn't like building the track it was kind of instantly there (laughs) so i just had to do the vocals and stuff so so that's the opposite of how we usually work which is we build a track just from me and john um so we we kind of ran all the different uh you know categories of that from one into the other and those other ones where we had um like on um the song called um can't let go that song has uh a friend of ours named Walt Vincent, who's a producer and a multi-instrumentalist, and he works at the studio sometimes. He's from L.A., lives in L.A., but he comes to John's to work sometime, and he was there one time, and and he agreed to do some stuff. We talked him into it, you know? <laughs> and so what, what we do is when, when we work with other people, I should have prefaced it with this, when we work with other artists, like on the at the ground level of the song, um, we usually... What we do is we play them the songs that we have to work from. Like these are the things we want to work oh, okay, on. Okay, okay. So uh, we have these. These selection. are available. Like right? these are available. Yeah, and we let them kind of decide. You know, because like what they have a feel for. So they'll go, oh, let's try this one, and let's try this one. So the large ensemble picked a couple songs, and we worked on with them. And then we did the same thing with Walt. Said, which one would you, you know, do you have any, you know, vibe about any of these? You want to work on any of these? Which one would you prefer? And so he picked this song. And so we did that. So he played bass. He's an awesome bass player. So we tracked uh, we tracked the song with uh, me playing acoustic and John playing drums and um, Walt playing bass. And so that became that, you know, the basis of that song. So it, it does really change. Like Walt doesn't play bass like I play bass. I mean, I'm a bass player, but, you know, everybody plays different. So it it gives it a little bit of a different uh, feel, which sometimes is great for me because I can, um, you know, I get sick of my own thing. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. I get it. I, I get love it. to try to do parts, but I do also get sick of the way I, I do it. And it's nice to have a different thing to kind of um, change it up to, for how I finish the song out or, you know, or how I'm going <clears> to <throat> do the melody now, or even in some cases, the words and stuff, it, it, it affects you differently, right? You, you, it just hits you and you're like, Oh, okay this has made it like this. So now I have a new angle on it or something, which was the case with that song. Cause that song had been around for a long time and I wasn't able to finish it ever. And uh, John always wanted to do it. I was like, I just don't, I just don't feel it. And not, and so we I needed a different thing going on. And so he and John, Walt and John worked out the kind of basic thing that they were going to do on it. And, and that helped me to uh, move past the previous version of it that I didn't, feel you know what i mean it helped it helped me to get get in a different mindset about the song and then able to finish it and i and i like how it turned out you know in the end but i didn't want to even do it in the beginning i didn't want to do the song that's well that's the beauty of it too you know the new life that's brought into it that's so cool like uh, so 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 using other players that can really change yeah for better and sometimes for worse but usually for the better like how it how it uh, comes out and how I respond to it then, especially when the song isn't finished yet. I'm like, okay, now I see where I can, what I can do with this, you know, and that, that song, it did affect me that way. One, um, I mean, I really appreciate your time and, and like getting the dive into no your, worries, no your worries. career and like just all the people around you and the songwriting. Cause I'm a, I'm a, this is like the type of conversations I really like to get into. Like, but even before I made the phone call, I've been reading books by Pat Patterson and like trying to get into like a whole new, I love reading different ways to write songs and hearing this whole like inside, like baseball processing and like, mm-hmm. 
to me, this is this is the best that it gets. Like, so I really appreciate you. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, but you know, and I, but I would keep in mind that you know, all, everyone does have their own way that you can fall into, and there's there's good ideas about how to get how to kind of accomplish and how to organize stuff. But I think once you get into it and start doing, if you get something you like, you know, the way it's working, you'll kind of have your own method. Oh, you for know, sure. That, you know, yeah, yeah. Like you'll 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 take the knowledge that you're you're gaining or you know the experience from other people but you'll you'll fall into a thing that feels natural for the for you how you work because you know at least that's my experience i i like to i i also interest in interested in how people do it but sometimes i hear how they do it and i'm like i, I can't do that you know, like, i just <laughs> totally do that. you know like you're a genius and i'm not and i can't do that so so there's just as many ways as there are you know people Oh yeah, for it. sure. And you can but, totally, but it's great to arm yourself with the different, to be open to you know the ideas of how they work. Um, it's 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 all very interesting, actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you could totally get lost in the sauce of like this is a whole other way to do it. Like, I just kind of like yeah. a, I like tasting, like getting. Oh, that's kind of like I got my own routine and practice. I I run all the time <laughs> just to do my thing, but also like. I'd like to glance through, I guess, different windows and like, yeah, oh, I kind of like this view. Can I do that? I don't know. I don't know if I want to yeah, say yeah, right no, that it's much. Good. But... It's, all, it's all good to know. And it's even good to, to try sometimes because sometimes yeah. it shakes up your thing. Like for me, I get tired of like what I, I mean, I've been doing it for kind of a long time. So I, uh, sometimes I get tired of my, um, I don't know, my like reaction or my habit. You know, yeah. like, well, here I would do two verses before I do the chorus. You know, I would just do the song like that. And it's, that is a thing I do, actually. You know, I'm, but sometimes I'm like, but, but do I have to do that? And like, I'm tired of doing it. <laughs> like, but right now, today, I don't want to do that. You know, so you look at how other songs are put together and um, and think like, oh, yeah, no, maybe my song could work like that. Or, you know, it's good to it's good to shake that up a little. I think it's good to have your method. But to always fall back on is kind of, I think it gets boring for me. I get bored with it and I don't want to, like I said, write the same song over or, or, you know, make the same records over and over. So I try to kind of be aware of it, or maybe you just know, you're just like, I don't want to do this again. You know, it's frustrating that I have to think of the same, you know, I'm thinking of the same thing every time, you know, so you got to push yourself a little bit sometimes. For sure. For sure. And that's when like these kind of like weird, different views, maybe doing it like that, maybe in, cause I've never been, I'm, I really relate to kind of your process was coming up with the music first and like building through that um, and trying to find that phrase or that, that song seed that sticks in your head. I've recently yep. tried doing the opposite, just writing stuff and like putting mm -hmm. that together. And it's, it's been an interesting, uh, it's a harder <laughs> experience, but it's been interesting <laughs> way more edits. Cause you're like, there's no, that doesn't fit with anything came up musically. But, um, you know what, you know what else is cool is, uh, do you ever do co-writes with anybody? Like try I to work with? I haven't tried that because yet. that is, if you, yeah. Uh, yeah, because people do stuff different ways, as we just were talking about. Right. So, um, it just can really open open your mind up to some things, especially if the, if I find especially if the person isn't doing stuff exactly like how you do it. Right. Like like this, I have a friend, this guy Caleb Means, who um, I was in a band with him and his his songwriting partner called New Ruins, briefly kind of um, years ago, and and they're um, quite a bit younger than me, and they their take on stuff is is fairly different, and I was just playing bass in their band, you know, because it was fun, but just seeing how they put their songs together and stuff, it was really fun to, uh, it was enlightening actually, you know, to see what made sense to them because i liked how their songs turned out like i liked the way their songs sounded but i wouldn't have done the song that way if it had been my song you know what i mean so i i could appreciate it but i didn't know how to just do it like that so that was in addition to playing the songs which was fun i kind of absorbed how they uh, their process of doing it what makes sense to them and um and you know through that you can see like well the thing they did was cool you know, and um, I, I wouldn't have thought of doing that. So why not? You know, like maybe I can think of like that, you know, use use their approach a bit or, or keep it in mind. Or, so when you write with different people, you kind of see how they do things. And then you can also add that to kind of your palette um, for when you're putting a song together. You can think, of, oh, what if I you know did this like 
you know, like I really liked on that one song when they did that, or you know, like that kind of thing. Or, or you know, writing for the people, people will suggest something in your song. Like, now I, and I was going to take it to here, and they'll go, well, why don't you go to here? Like, oh, huh. well, yeah. I don't know. I just didn't think of it, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. right? Because you can't think of everything at one time. So the, it can be a really eye opening experience, and um, it can be really helpful to for you further down the road, you know? Yeah. No, that's amazing. Like it, it kind of makes me think of like a, if you're going to the gym and you're working out with somebody as opposed to by yourself. And like, yes. not that I do that. That I, I don't think I've ever done that. No, but yeah, it's like that because because everybody does stuff different. And yeah. if you can learn how they, if if you like the the results of the thing that they're doing, um, then see what it is. You know, what are they doing? Like you know, and then you can maybe you can't cop it exactly, but you can keep it in mind. And the fact that you're aware of it sometimes is enough to, uh, you know, to help you in a, in a, when you're trying to change things up or, or you know, discover a different thing. You can it's maybe not, you know, maybe not quoting the thing verbatim, but you're like going, oh, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, oh, I have this idea about this kind of vague idea of how to do it a different way. You know, everything yeah. kind of uh, filters in, you know, to your brain and your creative uh, process, I think. And that's the longer you do it, it's beautiful to see how that, that like how that filter affects you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, oh yeah, that's why I started doing that. Yeah. <laughs> like, but um, really, at the end of the day, you just want to be pleased with the thing you're doing. So, and anything goes. Any way you can, you know, any way you can get that is, you know, for the for for the sake of the art, right? So, that's, you you go for it any way you can go at it. It's all fair game, just to get, you know, you you want to get the result. That's the that's what you want. So. Um, there's no rules. There's just suggestions, really. That's a that's beautifully said. Um, <laughs> it is. That's a, that's a great rule of thumb. Um, one one last thing I wanted to ask you about, um, and I kept uh, the track "Babyface." That song on the new record yep. took a completely different tonal turn and kind of made me think of the first record. So what I typically do is when Howard sends me something, I listen to it. I don't read anything about it. And with with your record, I went through it a couple times before reading anything about it. And I'm like, oh my god, this is so sick! Like it's like it's so well done. And like like when I got to the last song, every time I'm like, this is super different from everything else on the record. Um, yeah, that's and then true. later <clears throat> reading about Tommy. So can you um, kind of uh, I guess explain your guys' relationship and like because I think it's a beautiful send off. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, yeah, there's, there's a few things about that. This may take a few minutes if you have a few minutes. No, I, but, I got all the time um, in the world. I, I appreciate your time. Like, this has been a lot um, of fun. So, so Tommy Keen, uh, um, you know, I was a fan of his. I remember in being here in Champaign, Illinois, where I am today. And um, somebody, some like maybe some guys that were a little bit older, and more wise and about records and stuff said this guy, Tommy Keen is playing tonight at Mabel's, you know, the bar here in town, music bar. And, uh, you should really go, go see it. You should go check him out. So I did. And, um, you know, there were probably about 10 people there or 15 people or something, but, you know, he was completely <laughs> just rocking his ass off and he had great songs and it was just kind of amazing. I was like, oh, my God, who is this guy? So, um, you know, I started following his records and career and stuff. And um, uh, so a little bit later on, my friend John from Small Square later, you know, to be who I've known a long time, um, started to uh, do stuff outside of Champagne and he wanted to, you know, play with some of the people so he you know uh tried out for playing with tommy on a tour and he started playing with tommy and became his drummer from that point sort of forward you know for the rest of tommy's career and um so john has ties with tommy from that time and i had a, you know i'd known him off and on over the years but then uh when we uh after we did a record, Velvet Crush recorded Teenage Symphonies and it was released, we were on a major label at that point. We were on Epic in, here in the U.S. And we, they, you know, signed us up to do a huge sort of tour, world tour, basically, tour, you know, like Europe and everywhere. And so we, um, we thought, well, we, who can we get to play as our fourth, you know, our lead guitarist, fourth member, which is what we like to always like to do when we were doing, you know, touring kind of things. And, 
uh, somebody, one of us thought of Tommy. It's like, well, no one of Tommy would do it. Tommy Keen. Like, and I said, you know, like, well, I don't know. That would be awesome if he would do it. So we called him up and asked him if he'd do it. And he said, yeah. So we're like, okay, good. All right. Now, so, so Tommy toured with us and he, uh, he told me once that he, I didn't know how many shows he played, but he said he played 98 shows with us because Tommy had the weird ability to be able to remember every detail about every show he's ever played in his life. It was crazy, just crazy stuff. Like he would know what he wore. He could tell you, you know, who the promoter is and anything about the show. Just crazy. I don't know what that, it, what that's called. Some kind of a, you know, weird savant thing or something but um anyway he said so he played about 100 shows with us as velvet crush so we got to know tommy pretty well and became you know pretty pretty tight friends with them and uh and john continued to play in tommy's band so um in more recent years tommy was opening a solo acoustic for matthew sweet band who made the do tour so he did that for maybe two two or three different tours uh, I don't remember. I think two, maybe. <laughs> so he would travel with us and he would be the opening act, which we liked because it wasn't like a wild card every night. It was like a thing we knew and liked. And Tommy was great, you know, um, doing it. So he would just travel with us and like he was one of us, like one of the band. Right. And so we we got to know him even more then, kind of rekindled all that. And um, and he was actually going to be the guitar player to do the the Velvet Crush reunion. He he had been a cheerleader for that. He's like, you guys got to do it, and I'm gonna we're gonna do it. I'm gonna I'll do it with you. We're gonna do. It. You know, he was like egging us on to yeah. try and you know get Velvet Crush uh, to do some shows. You know, this is like around 2017 or so or 18. <laughs> and then um, so we thought, okay, well we are gonna do that. We're gonna try and do it. And we we even got together once and played with them uh, while we were on tour. We went to uh, Jeffrey's house and when he lived in the East Coast and we played with Tommy like, okay, this was fun. Yeah, we were going to do this. And then, you know, uh, not, not that long after, uh, Tommy passed away and it was really affected sort of, uh, everyone that uh, in my circle, you know, in my immediate circle, you know, Rick and I were sort of really distraught about it. And John, you know, uh, affected him pretty hard. And, um, it was just a big blow to everybody. And and I, I feel like it was a universal, like when you read stuff online about on Facebook and stuff, people were all, even if they didn't know him that well, they were like, Oh my God, they were crushed, you know, because of the way he affected people and the way he was. So during the acoustic uh, opening times when he was with us in the Matthew Sweet band, um, I kept saying, you should play Babyface, that song Babyface. I love that song. And it's one of his older ones, you know, He's like, yeah, yeah, I like that song, but like, I, I can't, you know, I can't sing it uh, acoustic. Like, it's, it's a little bit high, and it's hard to do just with an acoustic guitar, which I understood what he's saying. You know, I, I know that. I know I know what he's talking about. But I, but nonetheless, I would say it kind of every day or two to him. It's like, you should do baby face. <laughs> like, Tommy, baby face, is it, you going to get that out tonight? And I keep saying, you know, we're in the van. Like, hey, Tommy, you work on baby face? Or I'd play it, and I'd have it on Spotify, and I'd play it or something. And um, kind of a joke, a running joke. And I knew he wasn't going to do it, but... Uh, but I really do love the song. And so, uh, and I had the thought like, well, you know what? I want to, I want to record the song sometime. I'll just record it. I'll do a cover of it. Cause I like the song. And I've been thinking about it so much. And then he passed away and I was like, oh shit. You know, and, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to do that song. I'm still going to do it, but it's going to be, but I don't feel like <laughs> I feel different about it now. And I want to do a, a different, a different version of, so I, sort of came up with a kind of a keyboardy thing basic track and um a slow you know slow thing a sad you know a sadder song and i sent it to john and, and i said can you put some some kind of drums on this or something i want to try to build this into something <laughs> he said well i got these two guys here today i got adam olendorf and adam beard in the studio so maybe we can all do it together one of those guys is a bass player one of those guys is a pedal steel and guitar player and said, we'll just track something and do it uh, and then send it back to you. I said, okay, thank you. That'd be cool. So he, they did that and uh, sent it back to me. And, and he said, when you get the track, when you listen to it, you, you got to call me. You know, I got to, there's, there's something about it. And uh, so I got it and I listened to it. And, it's like, and I heard some weird noise on the end of the track. 
you know, when the when the symbols are like ringing out, you know, at the very end. And I was like, well, what is that? And he said, well, okay, that is um, one of the guy's phones was sitting on a stool in the in the live room where we we're recording. And um, when we got done with the take, we heard the sound. And we're like, what what is that? Like, there's some sound coming from somewhere. And it was one of the phones was playing a song just like on its own. Like it just got, I don't know, it, you know, Siri did, did it or something, you know, because somebody like took it out of their pocket so they could sit and play, you know, or something like that. So, but the song was one of Tommy Keene's songs. It wasn't the one we were doing, but it was this other song called um, 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 Compromise, which I knew and John knew, of course, because he played it with him. And it was playing when they got done playing the song, the baby face version. And uh, if you listen, if you go back and listen at the very end of the song, that's I left it in there because that's playing, and it we don't. It was the weirdest thing, and they were kind of freaked out about it because uh, Adam, the guitar player Adam Ollendorf, had played recently with Tommy, done a tour with him as a guitar player, and um and John, of course, you know, played with him forever, so it was very uh, uh you know, hard to explain it because nobody called up the song to, you know that wasn't even the right song but it started playing at the end of the thing. it was a little freaky that is and, uh, the compromise so i said well I've got, I've got to keep it on the mix i got to keep it in the mix of that so i tried to boost it up a little bit so you could hear what it was and you can't really tell but if you if you go back and listen there's a song called compromise that's the song that's playing and it was just sort of organically happened by ghost magic or something so that's my big story about the Tommy stuff um and the other song, you know, uh, Can't Let Go, it's called Can't Let Go, of Tommy. And that's another reference to Tommy because I, 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 I didn't have the lyrics of that song finished until much, much later when we had the sort of all the rest of the song done. And um, I didn't know I had, I had written the song as a, as a demo for somebody else. And I had the chorus, Can't Let Go part, but I didn't have the rest of the lyrics. And then uh, after Tommy left, left the building um we i said oh I, I know i know what the song's about now and i wrote the rest of, i wrote the rest of the lyrics because it was can't let go but in a different way it was the first the first meaning was more like a, a you know a lover or something like that you know and it had, took on a new meaning so i thought but it but it enabled me to finish the song uh so it was you know inspired by the loss of uh one of our one of our own and um so those two songs are or Tommy Keen tie-ins and uh, homage to what? some extent. But yes, yeah. you're right. That song does sound completely different from the rest of the record. <laughs> it's, but in and the I best don't know way. why. Yeah, but it's, it's. I just wanted to make it uh, not. I felt super sad for one thing, and I didn't. I didn't want to make it like a rock song. I wanted to, to break it, make it down tempo, and um, it ended up doing. I don't know how I got. I was in kind of a synthesizer uh, phase for a while there. Like on the end of that song, North Main Blues, I put a crazy synthesizer on that on that song. And it, it was kind of a I think this was kind of an extension of that because I was in that mode of trying to use synths. And um, just I was sort of tired of guitar sounds at that point, And I don't know. I just wanted it to be sad. And I felt sad about it. And it was well, kind of a joke, but kind of sad at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a, an astute observation by you. And it does almost sound like it doesn't belong on the record. But no, I, it totally does. It totally like, it, like it, it's it, it. It was an interesting note to end on. Like listening through and like after, like I said, after reading about it, it made sense. You know, it makes complete sense. And I think it's a the, the guitar on it's really cool. Like I, that's as a guitar guy, that's what stuck out to me. I'm like, this is different tonalities we're going with here. And yeah, like, you know, I, I tried to put it in a different place in the order. Um, I had it in a different place, I think at one one or two points, but it it, it just didn't. I couldn't kind of flow yeah. out of it. You know, I couldn't. It's perfect. It seemed like at. it couldn't continue. Yeah. So I thought it's really got to just end yeah. the record because of the way it's so down, you know, so sad like that. And um, you know, the original version is much more kind of uh, rocking and upbeat. And and in fact, so so Tommy's brother. Um, He's kind of a, in charge of his stuff now nowadays, and uh, and I and I he's a friend of ours, and I asked him what he thought of it because I said I want to I'd like to put it on our record, and uh, and he listened to it. He said, "Well, it's really uh, moving." And um, that song was 
uh, the song our when I when I married my wife. That was the first song that we we danced to at our wedding mm. because it was her favorite song of Tommy's. And so it was pretty emotional for for his brother to hear the song. But he he endorsed it and said, oh, you know, I, I it'd be it'd be cool to have it on the record. And um, you know, thanks for for you know asking and and doing it. So it was uh, touching, yeah, touching for him as well, which I, I didn't even know any of that, but um, it was it was cool. It, it struck a chord with him because it'd be it would have been bad if he hated it. <laughs> yeah, that would have been oh, uh, but no, that's but he awful. thought it was a nice tribute and a good uh, cool thing. So then I was like, all right, all right, that's cool. <laughs> approved, approved. <Yeah. laughs> well, it didn't matter. I mean, I wanted to do it anyway. Yeah, if it didn't end up on the record. That's okay. I just was doing it for me, right. really. And then I thought, well, we should put it on the record because of his. There's such a strong um, sort of vein, you know, with Tommy through both of John and and my careers and uh, friendships and musical, you know, inspirations and connections and stuff. So I thought it's really it's really fitting that it does go especially on a record by, by the both of us, you know. Well, it is a beautiful send-off, and I'm glad it got approval. And not only <laughs> approval, but, like, yeah. we like it approval. <laughs> um, me Paul, too, me I too. really appreciate your time, and this record's amazing. Um, before before we you. wrap up, is there – do you, are you touring with this? Do you have anything else to plug with this? Um, we, uh, we don't have any dates going on right now, but we're looking to do some stuff in the future. We're just um, – trying to get out in front of people the singles out ahead of the release the singles 23rd the first song and um um the release is on the 31st i don't know when this is airing this thing but it it will be out by then (laughs) so you know check it out it's available everywhere we have big distribution on it so we hope everybody will give it a chance and i appreciate you taking the time to listen to me ramble on about stuff not at all man i love it i love it <laughs> not rambling no tangent i love tangents well this you know i love this kind of long long format uh, uh i guess that's what you call it right sort of a long format podcast i like that because you can just really just chat with uh with the uh caster as yeah. we're doing here and not yeah, yeah. to worry about like hitting all the points we're just kind of like chatting which is much more comfortable i think for me anyway well it's not it's, yeah i feel the same way <laughs> Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.